Sorry, I'm back. How's everyone doing? You guys appreciate Pastor Isaiah? Man, I sure do. It's birthday. He's got a baby on the way. So you guys can just go ahead and give him a bunch of Pentecostal handshakes afterwards. He'll appreciate that. Some of you know what that is. Those who know, know. All right. Well, listen, I'm excited about tonight's message. We're going to get right into it. Uh, we're going to kind of do a little continuation of what we talked about this weekend. Uh, and the title is last weekend's message. We're in a little mini-series called Humanly Speaking. We talked about hard time waiting. And, you know, we talked about waiting and how difficult waiting is. And in the waiting, it's hard. We, we struggle with waiting. We live in our instant society uh, and, and people are constantly trying to get things through. And you can see in society, it's interesting, companies and corporations and organizations are doing everything they can to remove waiting because they know people just hate waiting. Uh, there was a guy that I, I got to go listen to. I've actually heard him speak twice now. And he was a, a, a former uh, VP of operations, actually president of operations for the Walt Disney Company. And he was over all the theme parks. And uh, he said, he had a slogan that was that he said that lines are the enemy of happiness. And so Disney spent literally over a billion dollars on line and system controls to try to reduce lines and wait times and then try to improve the experience. If you're going to have to get in a line, how to improve that. A billion dollars because they're like, that's, that's the thing. You know, and then we, we have Amazon who just keeps making, you know, shipping shorter and shorter. And soon we'll have drones that are delivering things right to your house. No wait time. Five minutes. It's going to be crazy. You're just going just gonna to show up just instantly. I'm still waiting for the Star Trek, you know, the little thing where you can just say it and it pops up. Thank, you know what I'm saying? Thank you. That's what I want. That would be fantastic. But we don't like waiting. And, and we... we are in a season and in a time where we wait for things less than, than ever. We get things faster than ever. Uh, and in a lot of ways, it's really good. There's a lot of things medically that you can get over very, very quickly. It's excellent. That's very, very good. Things that used to, like, kill you, now you can be better in, like, a matter of hours. It's like, it's great. Like, those are good things. We don't want to die over those things. When you think about that in history, one of the top killers of all time is, you know, diarrhea. Like... <laughs> I'm glad we don't need to die from that anymore. Like, that's good. Like, you know, it's inconvenient, but let's just not die from it. Uh, that's, that's not a good thing. Uh, but waiting is hard. And the problem is sometimes in our walk and in part of our process and part of our maturity or for part of God's plan or for things that we don't understand that all just have to do with God's sovereignty and some of the things that we have to do for our heart or for our relationships or for things that we do, it requires waiting. And, and it requires more waiting than we're, we're comfortable with. And each person's individual and the situations, it, it changes and it varies. You know, sometimes we don't mind waiting. It's like, oh, well, I can wait a week, but a month is tough. But a year, like, that's like, I've lost all hope at a year. You, you know, like, that's, that's, that's totally different. And it, and it depends on what you're looking for. But when you've ever been in a season of waiting, whatever it is, where you feel like you have God that's spoken something to you or a promise, but you're not seeing it and you're in the season of waiting and walking it out or waiting for God to show up, it can be hard. And, you know, there's a bunch of stories in the Bible where God sometimes makes us wait or where we see a waiting and we think, man, why... Why am I having to wait? Why would they have to wait? And I want to look at a couple of them tonight, just two specifically, and they're, and they're both about Jesus. And like I said, the Bible's full of, of a bunch of them. These were just two that I was studying and looking at. The first is, is found in Mark chapter 5, uh, a pretty familiar story. Um, and it's the story of, actually, you know what, before I do Mark chapter 5, I'm going to go a different one. I want to do Mark 11, or John 11, I mean. I'm going to read the first four verses. It says, A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured out the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her, her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God, so the Son of God will receive 
glory from this. So, although Jesus loved Mary, Martha, Mary, Martha and Lazarus, he stayed there for the next two days. That's kind of messed up. Like, they were friends, really good friends. Like, he stayed at their house. They supported his ministry. They, 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 they knew each other. They loved each other. And in fact, on multiple occasions, Jesus expressed his love towards Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They were good friends. They knew Jesus. They believed in Jesus. They believed in Jesus' ministry. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah. They had seen Jesus do all sorts of miracles. Uh, they've heard the stories. They've sat at his teaching. He's talked to them personally. They've got to look into his eyes. They are friends. They know him. And when Lazarus got sick, they thought, it's okay. It's going to be okay because we know Jesus. So we're just going to send a quick message, and he will drop whatever he is doing, and he's going to come right away because he loves us. He loves us. So he's going to come right away. He's going to come, and he'll, who knows, maybe he'll touch him, or maybe he'll spit on him, or maybe he'll put mud on him. We don't know what he'll do, but he'll do something, and Lazarus will be okay because that's what Jesus does. And what else would the other option be? So when they came and told him, it's interesting because Jesus did two things. The first one is he said, Lazarus is not going to die. And then the second thing is, and I'm not going to go fix it right now. And I'm sure the messenger was like, I'm sorry, what do you want me to tell him? Tell him like, I'll be there sometime, but not now. Tell him he won't die, it's okay. But I'm not coming right now. And you'd think if you were friends, you'd have more pull. I don't know if you ever thought you had a relationship that you had like a really good hookup, and then like when you tried to like inactivate or yeah, activate that hookup, you find out like you didn't have that hookup. Like, oh, we're not that cool. Ooh, well now this is awkward. <laughs> I thought I was gonna get that friends and family discount, and now I have to pay full price. And I can't afford full price. Ooh, go ahead, return it. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. But th this is interesting. Because he said, Lazarus' sickness would not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of the God, so the Son of God will receive him the glory. So when he passes this message back, when that person goes back and says, hey, uh, good news, Jesus says it won't end in death. Bad news, he's not coming. He didn't even give the old, my words can travel distance, and I don't need to be there to heal him. Because he could have also done that. Because just... Busy, can't go there, but I'll speak it his direction so he can get healed. He didn't do that. So they hear, but well, at least he says it's not going to end in death. And they probably had some hope. Well, Jesus said, Jesus said it's not going to end in death. But then he died. He's dead. And they've got to be looking at each other like, he said it's not going to end in death. But we buried him. And we put a stone in front of it. That usually means it's over. And Jesus waited two days before he went back. And now, the disciples thought he maybe had some reasons because he was just in this area and people had threatened to kill him and people had been plotting to kill him. And so that's why he had left in the first place. So they thought, well, he just doesn't want to go back because it's just not safe. You know, he loves them, but hey, you know, got to look out for numero uno here. And really, they were probably just concerned with themselves because they didn't want to get guilt by association. So when he said, okay, we're going to go back after two days, you would think the response would be like, oh, good. They're going to be so happy that you're coming. They've been waiting. Like, he is sick. Like he is. The first thing they say is like, are you sure we want to go back there? Like, people were a little hostile last time we were there. They were plotting on you. Thinking about killing you by association, maybe us. The disciples always put themselves in the boat. Like, people have been asking for us, Jesus. Like, no one's asking for you, Peter. They're asking for Jesus. Like, quit throwing yourself in the boat with him. You're like, you just are always in trouble. So they're like, I don't know if we should go back. I don't know if we should go back. 
But he says, we're going back. And many of you have heard this story. He goes and he goes back and he travels back. And when he's getting close, he gets an opportunity to speak to both the sisters. And it's interesting because what happens is he gets to encounter these women who are conflicted. And he speaks to Martha first and then to Mary. And it's interesting because he relates to both those women differently and he relates to them in the way that they both need to be related to. Because I, I believe that they're so confused because the person that they believe in so much and who they are told them this wouldn't end in death, but they were looking at death. And so they didn't know what else to do. And so when Mary saw him in verse 27, or when Martha saw him, she said, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. Which is like this statement, like if you'd have just come when I asked you, if you'd have just done what I asked, if you'd have just shown up, if you'd have just respected our relationship, if you would just come, we sent the message, if you would have just come when I asked, if you'd only been here, I know he wouldn't have died here because I know how good you are. I know what you've done. I've seen what you can do. And, and there's almost this essence of accusation as well. Like if you'd only been here, he wouldn't have died. He died because you weren't here. He died because you didn't come when we asked you to come. But, but at the same time, she still holds on to the fact that he said this wouldn't end in death because the very next verse, verse 22 says, but even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. And then there's this interesting dialogue because Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha says, he will rise when everyone rises at the last day. And Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I've always believed you're the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. So even in this, and, and I don't know in this moment, you know, it, it's hard to know if she's believing that this is the resurrection and he's speaking about eternity later or if she thinks we're going to get my brother out of the tomb. I, I, I don't know which one she thinks here, but I know she believes that Jesus can do anything. She believes in him. And, and, and she's not sure what, what, the, what the point is at this point. But she went and she said, let's go back. She called Mary aside and said, the teacher's here to see you. So Mary immediately went to him. Jesus stayed outside the village at a place where Martha met him. When the people who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed she was going to Lazarus' grave to weep. So they followed her there. The Jewish people had this really weird culture. A bunch of people had come. During, when someone died, they had this like culture. They were like these literally like professional mourners. They would come and all they would do is like hang out and like cry and like they liked it. I guess they just enjoyed a good cry. I don't know. It doesn't sound like my kind of thing. But like they would go and they would cry and they would wail and they would like get real like dramatic about it and like they would really just, you know, really make you feel like there was loss. And so when they saw Martha Lee or Mary leave, they're like, oh, she's going to the grave. We really should put on a good show at the grave. It's important to really, you know, cry hard at the grave. So they were going to go with him, her. And when Mary arrived, she saw Jesus, fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd only been here, my, mother, my brother would not have died. The, the exact same thing her sister said. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing, I like that, the one who, the sister is weeping. The strangers are wailing. A deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him, he asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. And then we get the very famous, the shortest verse in the Bible, then Jesus wept. 
And the people who are standing nearby said, see how much you loved him? But some said, this is the man who healed the blind. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? And it's interesting because Martha was upset, but we know Martha was more of a logical person. She was the doer. She was someone who, who had a very different type of personality than her sister. And she came and she asked Jesus, and she had a theological discussion with Jesus, one of the longest theological discussions about resurrection life that we have. And she's one of the first people to recognize and call Jesus the Messiah and believe in the resurrection and to have this discourse. And she speaks to him, and Jesus relates to Martha in a very, very intellectual, theological, scriptural way, in a way that comforts her, and who leaves her saying, I believe, despite the fact that I'm being faced with something that looks like it's impossible and dead. But then Mary, the sister, comes, and she does not relate to Jesus on some theological level. She's not talking about resurrection life and end time. She's not saying all that stuff. She's just sad that she missed her brother, that he's dead. And she's sad that Jesus wasn't there. And she's sad that she's not going to see him again, and she doesn't know. And it's interesting that the way that Jesus related to her sorrow was Jesus allowed her to see his sorrow. And Jesus wept and connected with her and said that this means something to me. And I find it interesting that even knowing what was about to happen, even knowing the end result, even knowing that he was on the way to the grave to raise him back up from the ground, even in that, he still wept. He still wept. He still showed support. He still showed an emotional connection with her, saying, I understand what you're going through in this time. And then the story becomes really great because... He goes, he rolls away the tomb, and he calls Lazarus out, and Lazarus raised from the dead. And the result of this is not only is Lazarus raised from the dead, and he lives. We don't know how much longer he lives, but he lives. But so many people believed who Jesus was, because this was the greatest miracle. And he'd been doing a lot of miracles. But this was someone who had been dead and in the tomb for four days. So much so when he told them to roll away the, the stone, they're like, hey, he's been in there for four days. You do not want to open that. It is not going to smell good in there, I promise. Yet it was fine. And he came out. And the result was many people believed in Jesus, which is exactly what God said, that it won't end in death. And the result of this waiting is God's going to be glorified. You know, sometimes, and we don't understand why, and I can't tell you all the details, and it's, it's different because I'm not God, and I'm not sovereign, and I'm not all-knowing. But there's times that God will put us through a season and a situation where we wait, and where even when we cry out, and we think we know what's best, we wait. And we may even think that, it dies, and it's over. But Jesus shows up because Jesus is never late. When Jesus shows up, he's on time. My wife wishes she had that superpower. She's just late. When Jesus shows up, he's not late. It doesn't matter what happens. If he's at the party and there's no more wine, he makes more wine. If he shows up and they're dead, he just brings them back to life. Like, that's what Jesus does. He's not late. He's not too late. And in our situation, at times, we feel like because we see the natural, we believe he's too late. He's missed it. He's abandoned me. I made a mistake. I did something wrong. I got out of his will. I messed up, and therefore, he abandoned me. He left me. He couldn't do it because I did something, and so therefore, we're too late. And many times, we believe that we've done something wrong, or he's angry at us. And the reality is, there's a, pre a purpose for the waiting. And usually, that purpose is, is that in some way, God gets glorified, and other people around become blessed. And it's so much so, it's interesting. I read this today, and you know, I don't know if this happens to you. 
I, I hope it does, because it's like one of the greatest joys that happens to me. I'll read a story, and I'll read it, I don't know how many times I've read it. I know I've read it before. I know I've read it multiple times. I know I've read it in multiple versions. And something, a detail will pop out, and you'll think, I don't, rem- I don't remember that. I never noticed that. And I was reading it today, and this part popped out to me because I went a little further than what I thought was the end. And in John chapter 12, so this is after the resurrection. This is after he's gone. This is after all these people believed. This is after all this stuff. The Pharisees were so upset, they'd been talking about, we are going to have to kill Jesus. We've got to kill him. We've got to set up a plan. We're going to get him. Jesus is going to have to be in hiding. We're going to find him. We're going to kill him. And in John chapter 12, verse 9, it says, when all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Then the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too. Sometimes the thing that God does inside of you and the waiting and the result becomes so big, you become just as big a threat as the one who did the miracle inside of you. Your testimony becomes just as damaging as the one who did it in you. Because they later say, like, we can't, this miracle was so big. We can't hide this. We can't steer it away. This guy's walking around. He was dead. Everyone saw it. They know he was dead. He was gone. And now he's walking around next to Jesus coming into Jerusalem. So we can't just kill Jesus, the one who did the miracle. We got to kill the guy that he raised from the dead. And that kind of made me a little uncomfortable. Because I thought, God, sometimes I sit here and think, I really need you to show up. But boy, I hope the result of you showing up in my life is not people plotting to end that life. But the good news is the Bible doesn't record Lazarus ever being killed. Not by then. But I found it so interesting that the impact was so big that the result of the miracle was so big, the result of waiting was so big that then everyone, there was a plot to kill him. Because Jesus told the disciples, it's good that I wasn't there because if I was there, I would have healed him. And if I would have healed him, it would have just been a healing. And it would have been another thing that a bunch of people would have just said, oh, he was fine. He was getting better already. He was getting better already. I could see it. He just was a coincidence. He was fine. Because Jesus even said, he, in, he inferred to his disciples, if I was there, I would have been moved to compassion because I love him so much, I would have healed him. And the reason I didn't go back is because I knew there was a greater purpose. And I knew there was a greater impact. And I knew there was something bigger that was going to happen. That his testimony was going to be critical. And if you look at this family, this is amazing. Because Lazarus ends up being this person raised from the dead. This very picture that shows that Jesus has the power over death itself. That with his very words, he can pull someone out of the grave. And he walks around. And yet it's his sister who's the first one who sees him alive after death. It's Mary, the first one who sees Jesus alive. There's something very special about this family and what they get to do. But in the waiting, God's still working and there's a purpose. And sometimes it's that time, sometimes there's that waiting, and sometimes it's even that something that can maybe feel like something's dying, that the resurrection comes back. I don't know if you've had anything in your life that has died, but Jesus resurrected inside of you, and the thing that resurrected inside of you is much greater than what died, but I have. I've had personality traits. I've had flaws. I've had things that I've held on to in my human nature that Jesus allowed to die, and what he resurrected back was something far greater. And often the things that he resurrected back is the thing that the enemy tries to go and kill. Because the enemy didn't care about me when I was an arrogant, unhumble person who just said what he wanted to say and did what he wanted to do. He didn't care about that person because that person was of no effect. But when Jesus let that person die and he resurrected someone else who was going to be proclaiming the goodness of Jesus, that's when the enemy all of a sudden decided, I need to kill that person because that person is picking witness to the power within Jesus. We 
we need to understand that when you see the resurrection after the waiting, the enemy will come to try to strike you down. They will plot against you. Don't be afraid, though, because when you're with Jesus, you're okay. He was fine. But I think of a second story I'll tell, and it's very similar, but a little different. And the point's the same, but it's the story of when, after Jesus had, one of my favorite stories, he he had cursed out legion from the man who was possessed, which is a whole other story, one of my favorites, because there's a lot of really cool details in there. He went back on the other side in a large crowd. Of course, there's a crowd. But the leader of the synagogue named Jairus came and fell at his feet and said, my little daughter is dying. Please come lay your hands on her and heal her so she can live. And this is a big deal because he was the leader of the synagogue. He was a Pharisee. He was the people who were saying that Jesus was a bad guy, that he was evil, that he was coming to ruin everything. And he was leading that kind of charge. All the Pharisees were hating him, and he hated him right until the point where his daughter was about to die, and he realized he had one hope, which was Jesus. And so he humbled himself, and he went to Jesus, and he said, can you please come and lay your hands on my daughter and heal her? And for the dads in the room, you know that if your kid's sick, you're kind of willing to do pretty much anything if you can help them. And if there's kids dying, like, there's nothing that's off the table. And so he went, and he humbled himself, and he came, and he did this, and he said, come on, Jesus, let's go. And there's all these people, because Mark always brings out the fact that Jesus went, and everywhere Jesus went, there was huge crowds. And a lot of us probably think, like, that's really cool. Like, man, when Jesus talked, there was crowds. But Mark makes it clear that in Jesus' minds, most of the time the crowd was the problem, not a good thing. The crowd was a negative thing. He was constantly trying to get away from the crowd because the crowd was there for a show, and he wasn't there for a show. He was there for relationships, and the crowd oftentimes was creating inhibitors for the relationships. And so there's this crowd, and it's there, and Jairus is like, Jesus has got to go. Like, my daughter's dying. We had to get to where my daughter is. And we don't know exactly how far it was, but it was at least a little bit of a walk. He's like, we got to go. And he's clearing people. And, you know, dads can get crazy sometimes, just shoving people, getting the things clear, probably trying to, like, hurry up the disciples because Bartholomew walks real slow. And it's just like, come on, we got to go. Like, pick up the pace. She wasn't doing good when I left. We got to get there. Like, let's keep moving. And there's just crowds and crowds and crowds of people. And, you know, people, I'm sure, are asking Jesus to do something and wanting him to bless the little children. He's like, you ain't got time for your kids. We're in line here. I'm next. Like, get out of the way. Like, clear it out. Clear it out. And it's at this moment when we have this intersection of a story where the woman with the issue of blood comes and touches the hem of his garment, and she's healed. And her whole story is great. We, will, we don't have time to talk about her, her whole story and the, the significance of this. But Jesus is still in a hurry, and Jesus stops and says, who touched me? And we know what the disciples say. Like, oh, everyone talks to Jesus. We're in a big crowd. We don't know what Tyrus is saying, which is probably he's losing his mind at this point. Like, what are we stopping for? Everyone's touching you. The crowd is everywhere. I can't punch them all in the face fast enough. They just keep coming. We have to keep moving. Like, I don't know if you've ever tried to get your kids out of somewhere. Like, if that's how I feel like it is. Like, we have to go. And it's like every time you try to get one, the other one leaves. Like, you can't get it. I have four kids. And so it's like, there's one of me. I lose. It's like I get one to the exit spot, and the other three have somehow escaped. And then you go get the other one, and it's like trying to herd water. Like, it's impossible. Like, you can't grasp it with your hands. And it's just like I'm trying to get them all here, and then I can't get my wife either. This is every Sunday, actually, when we're trying to leave. I'm just like, we just need to get in the car. Like, my tactic now is to pull the car up and to one by one buckle them in and lock them in the car. So I can like, okay, you are now locked in. Now you're locked in. I'm getting them there. Like, he's just trying to get Jesus and these disciples, like, to his daughter because she's dying. And now we're stopping because someone touched him. And he doesn't care. I don't care who touched you. And then there's this woman, okay, she's got an issue of blood. An issue of blood, she's had this for 12 years, Jesus, but she'll be fine another 12 hours. (laughs) My daughter's dying. Like right now, I can't wait. She's already waited. What's another day? She was poor, she's still poor. She was bleeding, she's still, now she's not bleeding. You can come back and talk to her. It's fine. 
I can't wait. I can't wait. We have to go. And yet Jesus stopped. Because not only is Jesus never late, Jesus is also never hurried. He's never hurried when he deals with you. You going to Jesus is never an inconvenience. You going to Jesus, he's never losing patience. He's never in a rush. He never has better things to do. You are his better thing to do. And so in that moment, he treated this woman with dignity. In this moment, he gave her honor. In this moment, he told her she didn't do anything wrong. In this moment, he took the time to affirm her to make sure she knew because she broke a whole bunch of rules. She broke a whole bunch of rules to get that done. Like a bunch of laws. She broke all sorts of rules. She shouldn't have been there. She technically made a whole, whole large group of people ceremonially unclean, and it was really close to ceremony time, so that was probably a bummer for some of those people. But Jesus stopped to make sure she knew you have value, and you can't leave this place thinking what you did is wrong. But in the process, the messenger came and said, hey, this is verse 35. This is why he was still speaking to her. And the way this is written, it makes me feel like Jesus was close, but not that close. He was so close. And he says, while he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the house of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter's dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard what they said to Jairus. Because you know that dad was just hit with the worst news of his life. Your daughter's dead. And you know there's got to be this weird mix of emotion that he's devastated because his daughter is dead. And if I were guessing, there was probably also a really large dose of like anger and rage because he's like, if this lady just wouldn't have stopped him, we could have made it. If we just wouldn't have stopped, if we wouldn't have had to wait, if we could have just gotten there, it would have been okay. But you couldn't do that. You couldn't stop. You couldn't be compassionate and caring for one minute. And now look. But Jesus overheard. Jesus had great hearing. In fact, Jesus heard even when people didn't speak. Jesus heard what people thought, which freaked a lot of people out. When somebody starts answering your thoughts, that's when you're like, ooh, I don't like this conversation anymore. It's uncomfortable. What am I thinking now? Um, in verse 36, it says, but Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. Don't be afraid, just have faith. And if Jesus told that to me, I, I don't know what I'd say. I'd be like, I had faith when I came to you and asked you to come do this, and now you're too late. Like, I did have faith. And then you left me out to dry. And now she's dead. And it's interesting because in verse 37, it says, Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John. Which I'm sure he was at this point saying, Why didn't you stop this crowd a long time ago? If it was that easy to stop the crowd, why didn't you do it earlier? You've been pressing against this crowd this whole journey. And I, I'm putting words in Jairus' mouth, but I, I, I think there would be this, this concept of the very thing that connects our humanity to people in a time that's very different but yet the same, which is why don't you do it the way that I think you should do it? Or why don't you do it the way that makes sense? I asked all my friends. They all agree. You should have stopped the crowd and come with me right away. Any other secondary things will be fine. It's like a triage thing. We, we treat the most important things first. The little bleeding thing wasn't that big of a deal. They lived a long time with it, but she was dying. That's the one who needed the most attention. Like, you're not doing it right. You're not doing it the right way. You're not doing it in the right time. You're not doing it in the right order. I know it for sure because look at the result. She's dead. That's my proof. It's dead. It's dead. And sometimes I think that's what we do in the natural. 
we look at the season, we go through a waiting, we ask Jesus, where are you? Why aren't you doing it the way I, I, there's, I'm, I've been praying? Have you not heard my instructions I've been giving to you in my prayer closet? I've been telling you how to do it every day. Exactly, I've given you all the details. Fire my boss, give me the promotion, new raise, new house. It trickles down. You just need to do what I'm asking and everything will be fine. And yet, he said, don't be afraid, just have faith. Wouldn't let anyone else go. And when he got there, another similar thing, and this is a whole other stuff, he just saw all this commotion. He saw the professional mourners, the wailers. He said, why all this commotion and weeping? The child is in bed. She's only asleep. And the crowd laughed at him. But he made them all leave. He probably wasn't very gentle when he made them leave either. When he usually removed people from a room, it was forceful. Says, then he took the girl's father and mother and the three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. And Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what happened. And then they told her to go give her something to eat. Reminds me of my big fat Greek wedding. Eat something. Uh, you were dead. Eat something. Uh, yes, Mom. So don't give up. Just have faith. I'm not late. I'm never late. I'm never late. No matter how late you think I am, that's because you think you had a plan. The only reason you think I'm late it's because you had a plan with a timetable. And your ways are not my ways. My ways are not your ways. My ways are higher. My ways are greater. You can never understand the depth of my plan. The reason that you feel like you're behind, the realize you feel like I'm late, the realize you think it's dying, the realize you think it's unrecoverable, the realize, realization that you think nothing can happen and nothing good can come from this and that everyone's going to laugh at me and everyone's going to leave me and this relationship is over or my finances are ruined or all those things. The reason that you feel that way is because you think you know better. But you don't. I'm never late. I always show up just in time. I always show up precisely when I mean to. And even if it means bringing dead things back to life, I can do it. Even if it means bringing new things into you, I can do it. Even if it means a complete transformation of who you are, I can do it. And in the end, you may think, wow, that's not how I thought it was going to happen. When you said it wasn't going to end in death, I didn't think you were going to let it die. But what you meant was, it's not going to end in death. And you never told me he wasn't going to die. Sometimes we have to look at what he says and speaks to our heart and what the Spirit brings to us. And when he tells us it's not going to end this way, it doesn't necessarily mean that we may not have to walk through that process. It's just not going to end there. It's not going to end end like that. And these two stories, though very different people receiving it and, and different circumstances and different scenarios, they just show this picture that waiting is not easy. Waiting is uncomfortable. And waiting is magnified and made even more uncomfortable when we feel like we know the way to fix it that we have a plan, that we have an idea, that we know how we can do it better. But many times it's the very waiting that creates the greatest magnification of God's glory in our lives. That God becomes the most glorified and that you have the honor of becoming partnered with him as a tool to be able to spread his goodness and who he is. He told that little girl and her family not to tell anyone. 
but he walked Lazarus right into Jerusalem with him. And Lazarus' very presence was an announcement of who Jesus was. When you realize and you go through that waiting and you get to the other side and Jesus shows up, you realize that the person that you've now become, the thing that that waiting and what that dark season brought out inside of you is now your very presence, the very person who you are, the fact that you're still here, the fact that that marriage is still going, the fact that that relationship still exists, the fact that you're still going to that job, the fact, the very presence of it becomes an announcement of how good Jesus is. just like the result of Lazarus, many people will believe and many people will be encouraged and many people will see the goodness and the power of God and God will be glorified. So my encouragement for you is don't quit waiting. Don't stop. No matter what it looks like in the natural, no matter how much your plans have been ruined, no matter how much it looks like it's impossible or bleak or will never happen, don't stop. He hasn't given up on you. You didn't mess it up. He's still coming. He's never too late. Don't be afraid. Just have faith. Don't be afraid. Just have faith. It won't end in death. It won't end this way. And sometimes we'd love to have all the details. I'm a detail guy. I like details. I'd love to know the full plan. My oldest son wants to know every minute of every day for the rest of his life. But we don't get that. And honestly, it's good. You, it wouldn't be good for you to have all that. tonight maybe you're walking through something and you're waiting maybe you've been waiting for a long time it's okay even if it dies God can bring dead things back to life Father God you're so good Father we, we know that it's hard for us to wait sometimes maybe most times if you're me and sometimes we feel like we know better. Sometimes we feel like we have a better plan. Sometimes we feel like there's a different way. But Lord, I just pray tonight we could put this in our hearts to trust you, to trust your process, to wait with patience and joy, to realize that your ways are higher, that it won't end like this. But as we wait, we just humbly believe that you're coming to work on our behalf and that you're good to us, that you've never forsaken us and you won't start now. So Father, for anyone who's here today and they're in a season of waiting, whatever it may be, I just pray that you could speak to our hearts just like you spoke to that man. Don't be afraid, just have faith. It won't end like this. And that we can just rest and trust in you until we get to see that miracle, Father. And that in that miracle, we can be living, walking, breathing testimonies of your goodness, of your love, of your miraculous power. And when people see us, they'll say, well, this has to be God because they were dead and now they're back to life. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We love you so much. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen, amen.